Finance. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Financial Independence Podcast, the podcast that gets inside the brains of some of the best and brightest in personal finance to find out how they achieved financial independence. I have a very special episode for you today. I've gone back through three of my previous interviews with one of my most popular guests, J.L. Collins, and I've extracted all the best bits from those episodes. And you may remember I did this with Mr. Money Mustache a while back, and it was a really popular short, like 10 or 15 minute episode. So to celebrate J.L. Collins's new book called Pathfinders, which I just recently read and really enjoyed, I figured I would do the same for him. So it was a lot of fun going back through these three episodes because one, he was my second guest ever. So the first episode I went back to listen was in 2012. And uh, the only other person I had interviewed up till that date was uh, Mr. Money Mustache. So it was fun to listen to such an early episode. The second one was right before The Simple Path to Wealth came out, which neither of us at the time could have imagined how successful that book would become so it was fun to listen to that knowing what i know now about how popular that book has become and how it's sort of become a classic in the personal finance space already and the third interview we did is maybe one of my most proud accomplishments as the mad scientist i would say um which i will talk more about when i get to introducing those clips but Looking back on that interview now, I think it maybe is the most important thing I've ever put out and maybe one of the things I'm most proud about, mainly due to the timing of it, but also the information and the message that came out at exactly the right time. So it was a treat to go back through all these episodes. I hope you enjoy this short episode that's packed full of amazing advice, because if you know J.L. Collins, you know he's got some incredible wisdom that he shared and now has three books and his blog. So big thanks to Jim for coming on the show all those times over the past 12 years. If you haven't checked out his new book called Pathfinders yet, go check it out. There will be a link in the show notes. It's a really enjoyable read. And if you've read The Simple Path to Wealth, it's a great supplement to it. And if you haven't, it's a great introduction to it that'll make you want to read it. So there'll be a link in the show notes to his new book. But yeah, I really just hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did putting it together. You talk a lot about the importance of FU money, but how do you know when you have FU money? You have FU money far before uh, you have enough to hang it up and never work again. You know, you, you, you have it as soon as, as soon as it makes you bold enough to, to say, okay, I'm going to go try something different. When was the first time you realized you had FU money? I figured I had enough to, to step away from a job. I had $5,000. Uh, I was in my 20s and I'd save five thousand dollars for my first professional job. I'd always save fifty percent of everything I made, and I wanted to go to Europe. And uh, uh, I petitioned them for uh, for a couple months off to do that, a sabbatical, if you will. And they said no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Okay." I thought about it for a week, and I said, "Okay, I'll, I think I'm going to go to Europe anyway." <laughs> I certainly didn't have enough to retire for the rest of my life, but but uh, it's it's as much an attitude as anything else. What kind of power does FU money give you? I asked for a couple of months off a sabbatical because I wanted to go bum around Europe. And I want to say I was probably 26 at the time. And uh, my boss said no, and and uh, which was typical in the times. This is in the mid-70s. And... Um, I didn't know any different. So I thought, well, you know, you go and you ask, the boss says, no, that's, that's the end of it. So I went back and I thought about this for a bit and I liked the job and I didn't particularly want to leave, which is why I didn't walk in and quit, but I wanted to go to Europe. And I didn't realize there was any middle ground. So I, after thinking about it for a week, I decided, well, as much as I like the job, I really want to go to Europe and I do have $5,000. <laughs> I've got this, I didn't know the term at you at the time, but, uh, I do have this sitting here that allows me to go. And so a week later, I went in and resigned. And an amazing thing happened. Uh, he said, well, wait a second. Don't do anything hasty. Let me talk to the owner. And lo and behold, uh, we negotiated extra time off for me. So I didn't have to resign. And that was an eye-opening experience. Because that few money not only allows you uh, to step away if you choose to step away, but it also empowers you. Uh, and gives you negotiating room that, at least in my case, I never knew existed. What's your biggest investing mistake? 
this is the biggest strategic mistake probably I made, that if I was going to get there from an investing point of view, it meant that, that you had a swing for the fences. It meant that you, you're, from your investing point of view, you had to be willing to hit home runs or able to hit home runs. And of course, in, to carry the analogy further, in that process, you were going to strike out. And nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, successful investing is not at all about swinging for the fences. In fact, that's a recipe for disaster. That's what uh, the investment community likes to see you do because they make the money on your trades. Absolutely. They make the money on you, you buying when you're swinging and selling when either you've made it or, or, or in more cases than not when, when you haven't. Um, the truth is that, that it's a matter of, of uh, winning, winning in increments. Uh, and Warren Buffett is, is famous for saying, you know, don't lose the money. <laughs> you think of rule one is don't lose the money, and rule two is don't forget rule number one. <laughs> right. And that's certainly not to say that Mr. Buffett doesn't, doesn't take risk, because risk is inherent in life, and it's in, certainly inherent in investment. Why is index investing superior to picking individual stocks? I have another friend uh, who had taken his MBA from the University of Chicago and was an analyst with a different company who began telling me about index investing and Jack Bogle and Vanguard and how uh, active investors, as you pointed out earlier, with disturbing regularity, underperform just buying every stock in the index. Right. And that seems so counterintuitive, and I resisted that idea for years, and and at, at great ex personal expense, uh, because I, I kept thinking it, it. You have to be able just to to beat the market. I mean, if you just avoided the bad stocks, right? Exactly. Perform, but what today is a bad stock is tomorrow's turnaround story. And there's no way of and knowing what, what what today's hero is is tomorrow's collapse and and uh, it is appallingly difficult to figure out which is which there are famous investors like warren buffett who seem to have been able to beat the index and the beat the market over a vast amount of time could it be that those people are simply just a statistical anomaly in the same way that if you had a billion people flip a coin a hundred times there's going to be some of those that are going to get heads every time there is a school of thought, with all due respect to, uh, to Mr. Buffett and, and Mr. Lynch, that says their success is, is no more than random luck. And, and that when you've got that many people out there uh, playing the game, uh, statistically, a couple of them are going to win. Right. And that may not be because they have such wonderful skill. It may simply be the, the coin toss. Uh, that, that they, even today, that's hard for me to accept. But whether or not that's true, what is true is the chances of you or me or anybody listening to our voices being able to do what Peter Lynch and, and Warren Buffett have done on their own is vanishingly small. Warren Buffett actually realizes that too, and he recommends index investing. He recognizes that that what he has accomplished is not repeatable by the average guy. It's not. Certainly not repeatable for somebody who's trying to do it on the side while working a full-time job. It's not even repeatable by the vast majority of, of professionals who, who have enormous resources at their fingertips and, and live it 24-7. Why are fees so important in investing? A lot of investors pay not nearly enough attention to fees. Right. And, uh, but they are, uh, uh, in fact... There is an argument that is made that one of the reasons that index investing is so successful against uh, active investing, that is, uh, professional managers trying to choose stocks to outperform the index, can be traced directly to fees. Because if, you have, if you're an indexer, there's very little cost involved in buying the whole market. If you're an active manager, there's all kinds of costs that are involved. And of course, before you can make any money, you have to make enough to cover those costs. Sure. So that factor alone gives indexing a, a tremendous advantage. You initially recommended a three fund approach, but now you've dropped down to simply two index funds. Why is that? I started investing in uh, 1975. So now I've just aged myself, dated myself. So I've been knocking around this stuff for a long time. And and I, I heard somebody 
earlier today say the, the definition of an, of an expert in the field is somebody who has made all the possible stakes, mistakes that can be made. And that's certainly, if I haven't claimed any expertise in this, it's because I have made all the possible mistakes that you can make. And by the time I started writing the blog, I pretty much made those those mistakes. So that was 2011. I guess I'd been investing for 35 years, something something like that at that point. So there has not been a lot of change in my philosophy or approach. And as I'm sitting here, the only one I can really think of is when I first started writing the blog, um, I recommended three mutual funds. I, that's one of the things that I'm noted for is is keeping things absolutely as simple as possible. And now I only recommend two. I recommend total stock market index fund, and I recommend a total bond market index fund. When I first started the blog, the third was a REIT fund. And I no longer, I, I have I actually have a post on the blog called Stepping Away from, from REITs. And... Uh, uh, I don't didn't step away from them because I think REITs are bad. Um, I stepped away from them because the role that I wanted them to play in the portfolio, I was becoming more convinced that they didn't play as well as I initially thought they would, and that the total stock market index fund was playing that role at least as well, if not better. And the role I'm referring to, by the way, is inflation protection. So. Uh, real estate is is somewhat commonly thought of as, as a good inflation hedge, and to a certain extent it is, but surprisingly it's not much better or maybe even slightly worse than, than holding individual equities. And so over time I, I decided, you know, if you own the total stock market index fund, which is the core of what I recommend, you already own REITs because they're part of the total stock market. And by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. So it's a way of holding real estate investments without physically having to buy uh, real estate, just like owning stocks is a way of owning businesses without actually having to to operate the things. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I just came to the conclusion that I really didn't re need REITs to to accomplish what I had originally put them in to accomplish. Why don't you think it's necessary to add a international index fund to the mix? This is, this is a key area where my advice uh, parts company with the vast majority of people out there who are talking about this stuff. The vast majority of, of sample portfolios that I've seen put together include international. And uh, as you point out, uh, I don't. Um, there are really three reasons for this. One, um, added risk, uh, added expense, and, and we've got it covered. So let's kind of talk about those. Uh, added risks, you have a couple of added risks when you buy international funds. One is currency. So when you own international companies and international markets, they're all trading in their local currencies. So if you own international, if you own uh, European uh, Companies, for instance, they're trading in the euro. If you have Japanese companies, they're trading in the yen, etc. And those currencies uh, fluctuate and trade against the U.S. dollar. So there is what's called currency risk that the value of your holdings will go up and down, not just with the value of your holdings, but with the value of the currency that you are holding them in. Um, you don't have that when you own VTSAX, which is the fund that I recommend, which is the total stock market index fund for the U.S. from Vanguard. It owns every publicly traded company in the United States. So the second risk you have internationally is accounting risks. So the U.S. isn't perfect, but the accounting standards and the transparency of those standards are the best in the world in the U.S. And we certainly have our Enrons. We have companies that occasionally blow up. So there's, that risk doesn't completely go away, but it is a lower risk than you have anywhere else in the world. So currency risks and accounting risks are two risks that you take on when you invest internationally. And then you have added expense. The, the cost of VTSAX, the Total Stock Market Index Fund, here in the U.S. is 0.05%. 
Uh, Vanguard has great international funds if people are interested in them. Um, their expense ratios are very, very low, but they're still about three times what BTSAX is. They run about, I think the day of last time I looked, they were uh, 0.15 or 0.18 or something like that. Still incredibly low as, as expense ratios on funds go, but nevertheless more expensive than our BTSAX. But the most important thing is, and, and the reason that I don't personally own international and I don't see the need, is we've got it covered. When you own VTSAX, you own about 3,600 U.S. companies, virtually every publicly traded company in the market. And the vast majority of those, or the, or the vast majority of your holdings, uh, are in the largest companies in the U.S., The what's called the S&P 500. About 80% of VTSAX is tilted to, towards those large companies. And those large companies, for the most part, are by definition international businesses. So if you think of companies like Apple or General Motors or Caterpillar or Google or Facebook, for that matter, these are international businesses. So when you own the U.S. market, you have a significant participation in the growth of the world markets. And you own it in the least expensive and the least risky possible way that, that you can own it. Now, having said all that, if somebody came to me and said, well, you know, I get that, but I still want to own international. I don't think it's a terrible thing to do. I just don't think it's a necessary thing to do. What do you think about real estate? Is your house a good investment? Well, this is a little trickier because, first of all, the value of houses doesn't always rise. Value of businesses doesn't either, but at least your business is in your control. The value of your house is a lot of people found out to their sorrow five, six years ago, um, may or may not go up, up or down and it'll be very little in your control. And some people say, well, yeah, if you buy wisely and in the right area and et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes what's the right area today turns out not to be the right area tomorrow. So it, it's a little more difficult. Traditionally, people say getting mortgages for houses is good debt because they will go up. Um, I'm a little more cautious about it. And I'm a little, and this, this is really beyond the scope of the book, but I'm a little more cautious about the idea of automatically buying houses because it's, it's a good idea. Well, I'm not opposed to owning houses. What I'm opposed to is the real estate industry propaganda that everybody should own a house, you should always own a house, and it's the best financial thing you can do. In my world, owning a house is an expensive indulgence. And there's nothing wrong with expensive indulgences if you can afford them. But if you're striving for financial independence, you have to very carefully weigh whether buying a house is, is going to suit your goal of reaching financial independence. What do you think about stock picking and investing in individual stocks? The problem with individual stocks is that when you buy one and it works, it, it's there are a few better feelings than than uh, analyzing a stock and, and buying it and then watching it begin to soar. But what I've begun to realize more and more over the years, and I am a slow learner, is that the times that it's worked and soared and it's such a wonderful feeling and the times that it hasn't worked and hasn't gone anywhere or worse yet has gone down, there's been no difference in my analytical abilities or effort. So it has been sheer luck when it's worked. It's not as if individual stocks and actively managed mutual funds can't make you money. I actually achieved financial independence investing in individual stocks and investing in uh, mutual funds that were run by managers that I thought would outperform. You can make money doing that. I did. But index funds are not only easier, they are more powerful. I would have made more money more easily had I adopted indexing earlier. You recommend Vanguard index funds above all others. So what is it about Vanguard that makes them unique? Vanguard does have a unique... Uh, uh, unique ownership structure, and, and this again goes back to Jack Bogle, who founded it. By the way, I think Jack Bogle is the, 
closest thing to a, uh, a secular saint in the investment world we can have. A, he's done more for, for people like you and me, for individual investors, than anybody else to come along the, come along the pike. But that uh, when he created it, he, uh, created Vanguard, he was, he was very focused on, on index funds as a concept and low fees that you could enjoy from those index funds. But he took it a step further in the way he structured his company. He said, you know, this Vanguard is going to be owned by the funds that operate it. And what that means is that, in fact, in effect, you and I, the people who own shares of the funds, own Vanguard through those funds. What's important about that is every other investment company, and in fact, the vast majority of companies in general, have really, you can think of it as three tiers. You have uh, uh, the owners of the company, you have the, the company itself, and then you have the customers of the company. And that company has, has two masters to serve in that, in, in that scenario. It has to serve its customers so they keep coming back and, and are getting value from whatever they're producing. But it also has to charge those customers enough extra money to pay the owners because the owners expect to be paid. Well, Vanguard eliminates that. Now, the important thing, and one of the questions that I get on, on, on the blog a lot is, is that uh, not every 401k or 403b plan that, that people have access to, in fact, very few of them uh, utilize Vanguard funds. And there are other good fund companies out there like T. Rowe Price and Fidelity. And, and due to competition from Vanguard, most of them have index funds, and most of their index funds are also Again, thanks to our friends at Vanguard, they've been forced to price them uh, at very attractive, uh, at very attractive rates. So people have options. I don't recommend any of those fund companies if you if you have the choice, though, because they're using their index funds and the low fees on their funds as lost leaders to bring you into their family. Their other funds have have much more typical fees, and of course, they're hoping to migrate you into those those funds. So. My attitude is, is to stick with Vanguard, the company that, that does it as a core value as opposed to, to other investment companies that, that do it as a business strategy. Could you summarize your core advice to those out there who are wanting to become wealthy and reach financial independence? If you want to be wealthy and successful in life, uh, there's really three keys, and that's avoid debt. Uh, live below your means and invest the uh, the difference. Hey, it's the Mad Scientist again from present day, December 2023. And I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to revisit one of my proudest moments as the Mad Scientist, and that's what's coming up next. So I just wanted to set it up a little bit. And it's my interview with Jim from the coronavirus crash. So to set the stage a little bit, March 11th, 2020 is when Tom Hanks announced that he had COVID and the NBA shut down for the season. And I think that's when America at least really understood the severity of this pandemic. And in the markets, it was a really scary week because uh, the circuit breakers kicked in on both March 9th and March 12th because uh, the drops were so fast and violent. So it was a really scary time. So on March 13th, so the day after the second circuit breaker had tripped up the markets, I emailed Jim with these exact words. Hey, Jim, hope you're doing well. Seems like people are really freaking out about the market crash. So I was wondering if you'd be interested in having a quick chat to try to calm people down. If so, we can try to record as soon as possible, and then I can push it out as a podcast episode immediately afterwards. So Jim replied and said, yes, absolutely. And they were driving uh, during that weekend. So we arranged it for Sunday. So we did the interview on Sunday, March 15th. And then I released this the very next day, March 16th which just so happened to be the single biggest drop that the market took during the entire COVID crisis. And again, the circuit breakers uh, halted trading and it ended up being 12.9% down on the day for the Dow Industrials, which is the second biggest percentage drop uh, after Black Monday. It was an incredibly scary time in the markets. And I'm so proud, not only that we 
put out the interview that we did that was hopefully very calming and hopefully helped a lot of you out there not panic and not sell and not do all the crazy things that you probably wanted to do at the time, which I know I wanted to do at the time, because thinking back to that interview, I can still picture exactly where I was, exactly how I felt and how scary everything seemed because it was so unknown. Everything was just about to lock down in the UK and it was an incredibly scary time. And the thought of the entire economy just shutting down, it it was just unprecedented. So uh, I'm incredibly proud of this interview and the answers that Jim was calm enough and sane enough to make. And uh, yeah, like I said before, hopefully it stopped a lot of you from doing anything silly because the market actually bottomed a week later and it's just been up ever since then, which again is still so crazy. I can't believe it bottomed so quickly. And that's the thing. You never know when the bottom is going to be reached and when you're on the upswing that maybe we'll never revisit those lows again. Who knows? But it was a crazy time. And yeah, even listening back to it just gave me weird feelings just because I know the place I was mentally and I know the place the country was in and everyone that I knew around me was in at that time. And it's just really weird to listen to. But as always, Jim's a calming voice with really great advice. So hopefully you enjoy listening back to it. And his advice is just as timeless as it was back then. And a quick apology on the audio quality. I recorded it with a headset and I think Jim was talking on his phone because like I said, it was such a last minute and rushed thing that neither of us had prepared for it. So the sound quality isn't the best, but I'm glad we decided to rush it out and not wait for good microphones. So to get back into it, this is my question to Jim. Is this time different? Every time there's a bear market, It has the feeling that it's something major and it's something different and it's terrifying. And almost, if you think about it, that's by definition, because if it were not those things, there would not be a bear market. Right. I mean, you know, if people didn't feel that way, if people weren't scared, they wouldn't be panicking. And if they weren't panicking, they wouldn't be selling off their stocks. And by the way, creating a great buying opportunity for more level-headed people. So by definition, every time there's a bear market or a market crash, it's something that feels different, feels scary, and feels like it's never going to end. But it will. Right. And by the way, if someday I'm wrong about that, then where you're invested will be the least of our problems. So let's think about the coronavirus in those terms, right? If the coronavirus turns out to be the new black death, and it kills 60% of the population, then yeah, it's probably going to be a long time before the stock market recovers. Is that likely to happen? I don't think so. There's nothing we can do about it. If it does happen, that we being the average person on the street, what's more likely, and not the least of, for reasons that, are, that we now have an understanding of the germ theory of disease, As an example, we understand basic hygiene, which they didn't in the 13, 1400s. So it's unlikely to be something like that. And if it's something that runs its course, as past epidemics have that have, have scared the market and scared people in general, then it'll run its course over whatever period of time that takes and the market will recover. We're compensated with higher rates of return in stocks because of ugly times like this and he's exactly right if the stocks if if the stock market was always smooth sailing then we wouldn't be compensated with the higher returns than you get over bonds if you invest in the stock market and you want those outsized returns that the market provides you need to understand that bear markets are are part of the landscape and You should never be surprised by them any more than if you live in northern New England, you should be surprised by blizzards. Or if you live in southern Florida, you should be surprised by hurricanes. It's it's part of the territory. What did you learn during Black Monday in the 80s that could help investors out there now deal with this crash? Black Monday, which is still to this day, even given the Great Depression, even given 07, 08, even given the drops that we've had now, was the single biggest percentage drop in market history in a day. And it was 23, 24%, as I recall, in one day. Mm -hmm. 
And this is in the days, by the way, this is obviously before the Internet, uh, before widespread use of, of computers even. And it was in those days I, I had a stockbroker, as everybody did. And I had a job and I was working and, and I didn't know the market had crashed. And at the end of the day, I forget why I called Wayne, who was my stockbroker, but it wasn't because of anything going on in the market because I didn't know. And I called him at the end of the day, and he and I were kind of friends, too. And, and I said, so how's it going, man? And <laughs> there's this long pause at the end of the phone. And he's like, you're joking, right? And I could tell from the tone of his voice something bad had happened. I said, no, what what's going on? He said, Jim, we just had the biggest meltdown in history. And, you know, I've had people calling me in panic all day. And that's how I first found out. And then after that, that Black Monday, that big drop, the market continued to grind down slowly, but further and further and further down. And at the time, I knew all the principles we're talking about. It's not like I hadn't heard this stuff. I knew what I should do. I knew I should stay the course. I knew that it was temporary. I knew that the market would recover. And a couple months later, along about December, I lost my nerve and I sold okay. and I went to cash. And if I didn't sell at the exact bottom, it was close enough not to matter. And of course, then the market, as it always does, began its relentless rise again. And I watched it and I couldn't believe it. And I kept expecting it to fall back to where I could buy it lower than what I sold it at. And of course, that never happened. By the time I got back in, it had, it had recaptured all of its losses and posted gains. I never forgot that lesson. And that lesson is what sustained me in 07, 08, because that was a terrifying time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that if I had not had the experience of 87, that I would have been able to stay the course in in a way not to mention the more minor problems that happened between those two events but you know 08 was the big one i'm yeah. not sure i had the fortitude to, to stick through it which is why i hope that my writings provide people what they need so they don't have to go through that experience but i don't know that that's the case what would you say to someone who's experiencing a crash for the first time as an investor and maybe they're handling it differently than they thought they would? What would you say to them and what would your advice be? The very first post in my stock series is titled, There's a ma Major Market Crash Coming. And the gist of that post is you need to toughen up Cupcake and deal with it, ride through it. And then in other parts of the stock series and in, in the book, I, I talk about there's two financial phases in your life, broadly speaking. One is when you're building your wealth and you're working and you have earned income, which provides cash flow. And if you're, if you're interested in becoming financially independent, you're living on less than you're earning and you're taking part of those earnings, that cash flow, and you're investing it. And ideally, you're investing it in, in a total stock market fund or an S&P 500 fund, and you're holding it forever. Now, the fact that you have that cash flow going in on a regular basis smooths the ride for you, and it allows you to take advantage of times like this. And so I would say, especially to those people, those younger people who are working and building their wealth, a bear market like this one is a huge gift. In fact, the best thing that can happen to you when you're building your wealth and investing is that you get to buy shares on sale, which is what's going on now. So certainly those people should keep investing just as they were before. This is a great time to, to buy stocks on sale. Now, the other side of that coin is when you're in what I call the wealth preservation stage, which is when you're living on the portfolio. And that's the time when you introduce bonds because you no longer have that earned income cash flow to smooth the ride. So you need something else. And that's the role bonds can play. And that's when you get into your asset allocation. I have a post in the stock series about how to choose your asset allocation. And what that allocation is between stocks and bonds is a very personal thing to, that depends on your own situation and your own tolerance for volatility. But once you have bonds in the mix, then when the market 
does something dramatic, either dramatic on the upside or dramatic on the downside like we're seeing now, your allocation gets out of whack. And when you adjust it, right now you'd be adjusting it by selling bonds and buying more stock to bring the stock part of it up. Well, now that allows you to buy stock at a market price. And by the same time, when the market goes back up, and now the percentage of bonds is lower than you intended it to be, you sell some of the stock in the bonds and and you're you're selling at the high. So that's the way you deal with volatility rather than panicking and trying to figure out how to how to time it. Circuit breakers were triggered twice last week. Is this crash happening faster than most that you remember? Bear markets almost always happen very fast. There's a saying on Wall Street that the stock market uh, takes the stairs up and it takes the express elevator down. And so stocks tend to fall very fast and hard in the bear market, and they tend to grind slowly up in bull markets. So there is nothing that unique about this one. Mm -hmm. Might be a little faster than some in the past, but but it's still following the same pattern of, of these things happen pretty quickly. And then when they finally do hit bottom, and there's no way to predict when that is, then suddenly you know, a couple months later, people are noticing, wow, you know, this is this is going back up again. Mm -hmm. Bear markets are actually a healthy, necessary part of the process. And this one is no different. The other thing that I would like our listeners to appreciate, and I wrote a post back in 2017, called Time Machine and the Future Return of Stocks. And basically, it was looking at the performance of the stock market from 1975, which happened to be the year that I started investing, to 2015, 2016, 2017, and there about 40 plus years, the market on average went up just shy of 12% a year, which is an incredible performance. I mean, just absolutely incredible. And I would certainly not suggest to anybody listening that you can expect that going forward. But the point of that post is I go through all of the traumas and problems that happened in those 40 years. This was not a perfect, smooth, golden period of time to be an investor. And yet the market still performed. And so obviously we're going to look back on, on this moment in time. And as, as there were many moments in time, I point out in that post in those 40 years is a difficult moment, but that doesn't mean the market isn't going to provide handsome returns over the next couple of decades. What would you say to someone who's only now realizing that they've maybe taken on a bit too much risk and they're not prepared for this level of volatility? The time to figure out what your investing strategy is, what your risk tolerance is, what your allocation should be, is not in the middle of the hurricane, which is where we are now. It's when seas are calm. Obviously, that's hindsight. So I would say to anybody who's panicking at the moment, don't do anything. Understand how you're feeling and learn from the experience. And then when things are calm and the market has begun to turn around and begun to go up again, then revisit your allocation and then make adjustments according to what you learned about yourself. Not what you learned about the market, because the market's doing what the market does. Bear markets are part of the process. So there's nothing unique in market behavior going on here. What you're learning about is how you react to that behavior, what your behavior is. And after the markets calm down, and if you were too aggressive before, then you can make adjustments then, but don't do anything now. Hey, it's the Mad Scientist again from present day, December 2023. I think that's a perfect way to finish this episode because markets are back on the rise. Things are calm again. So if you did learn anything about yourself back in the coronavirus crash, then now's a great time to revisit that and make sure your allocation is better suited for your risk tolerance and you'll hopefully be able to weather the next crash uh, better than you did in 2020. So huge thanks to Jim for joining me all those times over the years and make sure you go check out his new book, Pathfinders. Thank you for listening for all these years. I still can't believe it's been over 11 years since I started this thing. So thank you so much for listening and I'll catch you in the next one. Finance.